Here's what's coming today on the Woodworking Network podcast. This is to say drinking out of a fire hydrant is underkill. Okay, this is this is like dying and going to heaven. I'm like the kid in the candy store. Like this is amazing. Welcome to this episode of the Woodworking Network podcast. Join us as we explore the business of woodworking, big and small, and what it takes to succeed. I'm Will Sampson. Today's episode is sponsored by FDMC Magazine and was recorded live at the International Woodworking Fair in Atlanta. My guest is Bobby Miller, a woodshop teacher at Coon Rapids High School in Minnesota and the host of a number of social media channels under the umbrella of Mr. Miller's Woodshop. We will be talking about trends in woodworking education and some of the innovative ways he uses to connect with students. But first, I want to talk about no time for old ways. Probably the biggest barrier to productive change is inertia. It's the knee-jerk response to any sort of proposed change we don't do it that way. Notice that such a response has nothing to do with arguing against the change on its merits. It carries the strong assumption that the status quo is inherently superior to any form of change. Improvements don't have much of a chance in that world. But the real world is crying out for change. Let's take just one area, the need for skilled labor in the woodworking industry. I don't think I have ever encountered a business that said they have plenty of help and an endless supply of well-trained potential employees. So clearly the status quo is not working. But part of the deadly status quo argument is also a stubborn aversion to admitting that we ourselves might be part of the problem. It's always someone else's fault, or at least someone else's responsibility to fix it. At the very least, There's an assumption that the problem is too big for any one individual or business to solve. So why try anyway? No wonder we have made so little progress. In the big wide world isn't magically providing the help you need. Maybe you should take at least some small steps yourself. Start with how you are looking for employees. Are you just putting a help wanted sign on the front door, advertising in the same outlets you always use with little result? Maybe you've dabbled in some online tools like Craigslist, Indeed, or LinkedIn, still to little effect. It's time to try something completely different. Have you personally reached out to high school and community college woodworking programs in your area? Maybe you would be better off hiring someone with no woodworking experience. Have you talked to high school counselors in your area? Have you put the word out in your own social circles that you are looking for help? Maybe your neighbor's kids are candidates. Or perhaps one of your friend's friends knows someone responsible and trainable looking for work. The potential list of networking ideas is endless but none of them are likely what you've always done. Most shops don't even want to invest in their own in-house training program. They want to hire pre-trained individuals, and they give up on filling a slot if they can't find them. They often argue that training is a wasted investment because the trained worker will go elsewhere. Let's just call it like it is. Too many of us are too lazy to try to make a difference. Complaining is usually easier than acting, but it rarely brings any better results. Think about it. What can you do today to make a difference, no matter how small? Progress comes sometimes slowly, one step at a time, but that's still a step in the right direction. Before we get to our interview with Bobby Miller, let's pause for a word from our sponsor. FDMC Magazine is your vital source of information to improve your woodworking business. Whether it's keeping you apprised of the latest advances in manufacturing, helping you solve your wood technology problems with Jing Wangert, or inspiring you 
with case histories about successful businesses and best practices, FDMC Magazine is there to be the sharpest business tool in your shop. Learn more and subscribe for free at woodworkingnetwork.com slash FDMC. Now let's talk with Bobby Miller. We are live here at the International Woodworking Fair in Atlanta uh, doing a live podcast. And I have as my guest today, Bobby Miller, who is an educator from Minnesota. Welcome to the Woodworking Network podcast, Bobby. Yes, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. That's great. And and I was talking to you before we came on here, and, and you are involved in a lot of different interesting projects, but I, I kind of want to go back to the beginning. How did you get involved in woodworking to start with? Well, my dad was a woodworker at first, so, so he built the cabinets in our house and all kinds of other little stuff for my brother and I when we were kids. And so that's just kind of my foundation. Um, as I kind of matured and went through high school, I had an amazing shop teacher and an amazing woodworking program. Um, after that, I decided I want to be a teacher, and I started out in history. I thought I'd be a social studies teacher, and during the summers, I'm working summer jobs in roofing and painting and deck building and maintenance, and I had my own company for a little while. It was called 3M. Have you heard of it? <laughs> they were maintenance and mowing. You haven't there heard of it? Okay. <laughs> I think there's another 3M. <laughs> yeah, there, there might be. I, so I did that, and um, once I graduated from the U of M, uh, I'm at the University of Minnesota, that is. Uh -huh. I had a history degree, and I was still thinking teaching, and so I went into their teacher pro. tried to go into their teacher program. It wasn't accepted, and so I, I kept on with the painting company that I was at, started my own business, and I could substitute teach. And so I got lots of professional education doing uh, substitute teaching, and a couple woodshop teachers that I'd sub for took me under their wing and pointed to the program at St. Cloud State to get certified, and so... Really, my woodworking career started when I became a woodworking teacher. Interesting. Which is not ideal, right? No, well, they, but they, on the other hand, they, they say that the best way to learn something is to be forced to teach it. Yes, yeah, so that was, uh, yeah, I guess that's what you could say. So that was seven years ago. I've since advanced quite a bit. I've taken jobs in cabinet shops local to my house. Um, I've, I'm into this stuff big time. I've done lots of epoxy river tables. Our uh, program has got lots of CNC machines. I've been now with uh, two different districts and uh, three different schools, I should say four different schools. And so I've been in a lot of wood shops, professionally and in the educational world, and I just, I dig this stuff. So now the, the level you're talking for the shops that you're teaching in, is this high school I programs? Did, um, yeah, so predominantly, I'm coming up on my 10th year of teaching, and so all but one have been in high school. That was, uh, That's great. That was the COVID year, and we were largely remote the entire time. And it was a good old eye-opening experience into a middle school wood shop. I can't match the energy. Right. How, how do you teach? How do you teach woodworking remotely? It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't work very well. And funny enough, that came at the time when my daughter was born. And I say it wasn't good for any of the kids except one, my kid. <laughs> so I was home. I actually did a lot of cool projects in my garage, but then it got to the point where it wasn't really fun for the kids to watch me have the fun. And so I, I stopped doing some of the videos. And I tried to put more CAD involved. And that's hard, too, when you've got just a, a Chromebook as far as what the kids are, have access to. So it's Tinkercad. It's um, watching some of the demonstrations on some of the larger softwares. So it wasn't a good thing. It wasn't a good time for the woodworking education industry, if you ask me. Yeah, so, so it sounds like you've got a diversified program. And I know that you're also doing stuff on youtube and you have your own podcast yeah it's nothing like that so okay it's just me and my iphone and uncut and unedited and authentic okay we'll call it authentic, authentic. there you go that's good that's good how many kids do you roughly have a year in your program uh, a couple hundred so i run through a couple hundred kids about every trimester i'll have four classes that are about 24 25 kids so i guess that's about 300 a year i misspoke I'm not a math teacher, though, so don't hold it against me, okay? <laughs> That's all right. We're here at the International Woodworking Fair in Atlanta, which uh, for those of you in the audience that have never been there, it's a huge show. Uh, with, uh, it takes up the entire Georgia World Congress Center, three huge halls. There's more than 1,000 exhibitors. Um, I think there's something like 20,000 attendees. Um, this is, I know, your first time here. Yeah. 
what's your and you and you came here working with a, a machinery company that you're helping helping them sell. What's your first impression about this show? This is to say drinking out of a fire hydrant is underkill. Okay, this is this is like dying and going to heaven. I'm like the kid in the candy store. Like this is amazing, and I, I'm so grateful that Safety Speed um, is is sponsoring me to be here. I'm helping them sell. I'm helping with their marketing and. Um, I trained some of the staff at the woodworking seminar over the summer, and we've been doing a ton of stuff. And I just, I think the world of safety speed, they're actually donating an SR5U panel saw, a sound router, sound router combination machine to Coon Rapids High School. And that is just way above and beyond what that's I've ever great. expected. That's Typically great. over the summers, I'm working cabinet shop jobs because that's my skill set. And I, I, while well, I enjoy that, this has been a lot more fruitful for my career at this stage of my career where I'm not so much in the learner seat anymore. I've done commercial, residential, big time custom cabinet jobs. And I've also made the cabinets for the break room at, at work. So, I mean, it's, I've, had, I've had the span of experience and now that, you know, I, I gotta make up those paychecks in the summer that I'm not paid, right? So I gotta do something. And so Brian Donahue, the president of Safety Speed is connected with Coon Rapids High School via our apprenticeship program. And he was just instrumental in thinking this through of how this could work and what it would bring to my program. And I'm doing as best I can to bring as much business and whatnot to safety speed. Well, that's great because, you know, the, you probably heard that so many folks in this industry say they can't fire, they can't find skilled employees. And... You know, we, we have talked a lot on this podcast and in our publications about having a better partnership between the industry and education. And it seems to be difficult to get that done. What what do you think is the way that we can do that to make that work? I'm encouraged after this fair. I thought it was all going to have to be me before I came here. But luckily, Brian Donahue is on the National Woods Board. And so I... I, I, like I said, I've got my own podcast, Mr. Miller's Wood Shop. All my stuff is Mr. Miller's Wood Shop, too, by the way, if you're looking at corn. Because of the kids, right? Well, That's yeah. what they call you, Mr. Miller. Yes. Wow. Yeah, I, I kind of thought, like, how can I write this out to where it can be mine and it can be kind of like geared towards the educational side? So, and I'm the only one doing it. Um, I'm the only one who's got a Mr. Miller Wood Shop. So it was easy to find the Gmail account Great. and all that. I mean, Great. I'm not trying to have lots of extra work for myself, but. Um, to get back to your question, like I was so encouraged when I went to the National Woods Boards Conference, one of the educational pieces here at IWF, and I was actually stewing the entire time because as the presenter was going, Tom was his name, I am just like jumping in my seat because on one of my first podcasts, I talk about my mission and vision and the presentation that Tom gave for the yeah, National Thomas, Woods Board. Thomas a lot, who is yes. the, the uh, chairman of the board for the uh, National Woods Board. Yeah, and he's also an educator at Stiles University. Yeah, so while he was presenting, I am just thinking, like, this is an echo of everything I said in my first podcast. And he had data, and he was far more articulate than I was trying to, like, say, like, there's a, there's a divide here. There's a wall here between industry and education. For instance, a teacher that I revere had not heard of IWF. He is on the cutting edge of education. He's in the biggest district of, in Minnesota, and he had not heard of IWF. Like how how does that happen? And um, just all the other this is the partners. biggest biggest woodworking show in the Western Hemisphere. Yeah, <laughs> there's not many bigger than this so, in the world. No, so yeah, that's great. And and you know, it's been frustrating for those of us who've been in the industry for uh, you know decades that we keep talking about this same problem and the same challenge, and it's it's tough to get industry and education together working uh, to solve basically the same problem and and you know it's it's a long-standing divide yeah it's it's really sad too because the educators now don't know the opportunity that's out there and a lot of times we're not setting up with the skill sets to be successful so i was shocked at the amount of robotic arms that were here and we've got a robotic arm um educational piece in our school where we've we have them use it and program our robotic arms, but I did not anticipate seeing those here. So that's just one thing that just floored me. Oh, they're all over the place here. Yeah. In fact, I was uh, watching uh, yesterday a company called Lalinge uh, from Sweden 
was demonstrating a uh, robot uh, that was assembling a complete cabinet box all by itself with no glue, no fasteners, using a uh, joinery system kind of like uh, what's used for uh, flooring, for, you know, laminate flooring. Sure. And uh, um, it would, in a minute, it would put the box together and then pick up the completed box and set it aside or stack it and get on to the next one. In a way, that's kind of sad because that's a problem caused by the shortage of skilled labor. Right. So I, I, I'm curious to see that, but also kind of it's a bummed. But I well, don't think you know, I think you know, people get scared about automation. They say, "Oh, it's going to take jobs." It doesn't really take jobs. It adds opportunity. You know, it takes away menial jobs and repetitious jobs that most people really don't want to do anyway, and then it gives more room for people doing the high value, high skilled jobs so that you can have more in both. Yeah, I completely agree. We've got five CNCs at Coon Rapids High School. That's and That's, that's got to be a record, I think, across the country. And we've even got a handheld CNC, that Shaper. The Shaper um, origin, yeah. We got one last deal. year. It's, it's a little bit over my head at this point right now. We've done some cute little bow ties and things like that, but boy, it is, it is remarkable what's out there. And so to keep up with this 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 um, moving target of where the industry is at, I think we got to be coming to these shows as educators. Well, I think too that's because that illustrates the the real divide between industry and education is that they don't know enough about each other. And educators in particular, there is a long history. And it's not everybody, but there is a long history of trying to force kids to get into a track to a four-year university. Yeah. And and also there is a long-standing misperception of the woodworking industry as being somehow dirty and dangerous and, and terrible and low-tech. And it's none of the above uh, if it's done right. And, and you walk in this show and it's the highest of high-tech all over this show. Yeah. And I don't think that the education community by and large gets that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. And it's, it's tempting too, as an educator, to set up your program, to have your plans that you do and not touch it again. And that's where I wanna avoid. And Safety Speed has empowered me to do this. So over the summer, I, I create woodworking plans for my students and I'll give them away to teachers or anybody else who wants them for free. I'm never gonna ask you for any, I'm not gonna try to make 499 off of my woodworking plans, like some of these folks. And what I, what I think my methods are unique is, and unconventional, is that after safety training, we go through about two weeks of safety where I'm hand over hand with the kids on the table saw, bringing that anxiety level down. And once they've proven they can do it, they test it out, and I've got some parent um, um, liability waivers, then I give them a woodworking plan similar to this, He's showing me a, 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 yes. a, a coffee table plan. That's cool. Yes, and so I, there's a cutting list like a normal woodworking plan, but then I've written this as about as simple as you can make it for high school kids because the kind of kids that enter my shop, they're not reading at a college level. So if you give them the wood magazine plan, that's great. They're not going to read it. I was given the wood magazine plan about five years ago, and I didn't read it. Okay, I've looked at the picture, I figured it out. I'm naturally kind of a problem solver. And I find a lot of my students are that way too. And so what I've broken it down for kids is that that exact step that they're on, they can read through the bullet points. I mean, they're written about a, about a sixth grade writing level, which is probably where I'm at. But then I've got a QR code right here that links to a YouTube video of me oh, great. doing that exact step. Now here's the controversial part. I've stopped doing live demonstrations in lieu of this. And I've found that it is far more efficient and effective. If you imagine your typical demonstration where you're watching a professional, he's gonna get things set up, he's gonna put in all the screws. And so I've got, um, like right here is my coffee table plans. It's my beginner project in the series that Safety Speed sponsored me to, to drum up for them using their equipment. Here's a step where they're actually standing up their table. One of the most exciting things, like when your kid starts to walk, you know, they're standing up. This video is less than five minutes, and I could not do that demonstration live for you and everybody here in, in under minutes. 20 minutes. Right. Okay, right. so I have fast forwarded it, I clipped it tail to tail, 
I don't have to talk to those guys over there that are talking in the meantime. Right. I don't say, oh, hey, I forgot the bid. I'll go get this. No it's, disruptions. It's, it's, yes. I say perfect. Some of them I have some bloopers and outtakes and, you know, um, that kind of come in the video too, but that can come, kind of be a fun. So can the general public access these videos or are they on YouTube? Yes. Yep. It's all under Mr. Miller's Woodshop. Mr. Miller's Woodshop on YouTube. Yep. Yeah. Feel free to check that out. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a rookie at this as far as the online world and trying to create a presence. But I, I, I'm a, I feel like I'm a decent woodworker. And so I've, I've started editing these videos so they are short, so they are to this point. And I find that this works in my class because now that kid that is ambitious, that wants to work ahead, doesn't have to wait for me, wait for the rest of the class to get through what they need to get through. So when he's ready or she's ready, watch this video. A lot of times I tell them, watch it at home. And then when you get here, just right away. And in the videos, I'll tell them where the screws are, where the jigs are, where right, the right, batters right. are in the room so it's it is kind of specific to my shop but i'm not <clears throat> opposed to anyone else using this method and i've talked to a couple other teachers that do this method they're just kind of hush hush about it i almost lost my job doing this because they looked at this oh you can't be doing this way you got to give live demos and it's not like i'm kicked up in my office drinking coffee i'm fixing equipment that's broken right. i'm helping kids that are scared right. i'm dealing with behavior issues well, like you everybody can, you can pay closer attention to to every all of your students. This method, I've cloned myself 30 times. For all the kids in the classroom, each time they want to go to the next step, they can. Now I'll have some stop signs and things like that before they rip and rip it on the CNC. But at that point I can, I don't, sometimes it's cheesy. Like I want them to watch the video, so I won't ask them like, okay, what is your, um, what is your datum level? I'll ask them, what color was my shirt in the video? No, 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 or no. what song was playing in the background and a lot of times i'll mention that in the video too like remember i'm wearing a red shirt right now go cardinals it's red cardinal red right 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 and so they kind of pick up like okay so they don't have to go back unnecessarily so that's the test i'm not i'm i'm trying to be as little of a gatekeeper as possible once they once they're through safety i'm big on safety i'm 10 finger club member for life right. they do not ever take their safety glasses off in my shop I, and i Tell this story too about how I was shot with a nail gun in the shoulder, taking attendance. So I don't care if you're just sitting down doing your math all mark, you're gonna wear your safety glasses in my shop because if I can get shot in the shoulder with a nail gun, taking attendance, something like that could happen to you too. No. Now tell me, like, do you have, you know, we're talking about trying to, to get kids to get to a level that they can be uh, productive employees in industry. Do you have any success stories to share of kids that have gone through your program and have actually made a career of this or, or started a career or just even yep. got a job? Yep, I, I've got, I, I'll, uh, so I got three stories I can tell you. So a classmate of mine is actually the number two at Lakeside Cabinets, our cabinet shop up by where we, um, where I teach up in Minnesota. And he's the number two there and he's only a couple years older than me. So he's not that old if you ask me. And he's, he's got a wife and kids. He's got a comfortable life. And we go and tour their shop a couple of times um, every couple of years. And it's, it's phenomenal to see what's going on. They got a lot of the equipment that you see here. And so when I can bring kids to their shop, see a classmate of mine makes it enjoyable for me. And he can give back to the program as well. And it means it by shutting down production for a couple hours while we pass through. And then I've got uh, a couple of kids um, that have started their own business. And they've revealed to me that they didn't need all these other programs and all these other required classes. The class that made the most difference was mine. And I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I go through safety, build materials, how to build. And I also talk a little bit about how to market yourself. Once they were done, I'm also a graphic design teacher too. And so I've put up this cheesy little thing where I want you to draw, uh, draw yourself up an ad a magazine. Oh, that's cover. a great idea. For your end table, for your entertainment center, for your rocking chair, whatever you built. Okay, make a make a magazine cover for it. And some kids really do a good job. Sometimes it's just a picture of their stuff. No, but it gets them thinking in that direction too. That's that's great to introduce those levels because you know most of the, I tell people that most of the people that go into woodworking we go into it because they like to make stuff, not because they intended it make a lot of money in a business yeah. and they need to learn those business skills 
uh, to be successful and, and yeah. survive. Last, uh, last story I'll share on one of my former students. Um, he went through my whole program and he was like, where do I go next? And I gave him several employers looking, but his folks really wanted him to go the college route. And so they compromised with St. Paul College. They have a cabinet making program there. And we actually toured there a couple of years ago after he graduated. And it was great. I was it. You know, we were in their shop. He wasn't actually in the class at the time, sadly, so I wasn't able to connect. But I found his locker where um, you know, all his stuff was stored and his tools and whatnot. And I tested it and it was open. And so I just trashed the thing. And then I wrote, it's good. To, I, I, I wrote something about like, it's uh, great to see you being successful because the teacher had nothing but good things to say about him. And uh, I thought, this is going to be funny. He's trashed my shop for four years. Now I'm going to come back and just poop up. And then I just moved a few things. It wasn't like right, I totally right. ruined anything right, or right, stole anything. Right. I just, he, was, he just knew that Kilroy yeah. was there. Oh, yeah. He knew, <laughs> he knew that Miller was there. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 That's great. Well, I I wish you a, a huge amount of luck in this and, and anything that we can do to get you involved in the National Woods Board or any of these other things or help you with industry contacts. It's great. I love the, the innovative way you're using video and that sort of thing. There's a lot of great things that you're doing that I think are techniques that can be shared with the rest of the industry. And, and so more power to you, Bobby. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. And if, if anybody is interested in following up, I'm not making any money on this, but all my Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, podcasts on Apple and Spotify, it's all Mr. Miller's Woodshop. It's Mr. Miller's Woodshop. That's great. I all right. It, I wrote it down here. So it's M-R-M-I-L-L-E-R-W-O-O-D-S-H-O-P. <laughs> great. In case you can't spell like me. <laughs> well, that's great. One of these tired days, I'm going to have to get up to your shop and visit. I'd love that. That'd be great. Thanks a lot, Bobby. Yeah, thank you. That's it for today. If you're looking for more of our podcasts, you can find all of them at woodworkingnetwork.com slash podcasts and in popular podcast channels. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks again to today's sponsor, FDMC Magazine. If you have a comment or topic you'd like us to explore, contact me at will.sampson at woodworkingnetwork.com. Thanks for listening.